Hi, welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Graben, and today we're joined by Matt May. He is a recognized thought leader on business strategy, human-centered innovation, and lean operations. He's influenced by nearly a decade spent as a full-time advisor to Toyota, and he's the author of five books, uh, books I've really enjoyed. They include the best-selling The Elegant Solution, The Laws of Subtraction, and winning the brain game. He's had articles in publications like the New York Times, HBR, and Fast Company. He has an MBA from Wharton. And Matt is a founder of Stratechia, a Los Angeles-based strategy and innovation firm. Uh, so with, with that, Matt, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you, sir. So we'll dive right in. I'm sure you've got a good story for us. What is your favorite mistake? Uh, my favorite mistake or best mistake is, uh, is one that you actually just mentioned. Uh, I have an MBA from Wharton, um, pretty prestigious business school, always up there in the top five or so. I graduated too long ago to, to count the years. I want we'll, just, we'll put it at the mid eighties. <laughs> um, but of the 750 or so graduates of my class, I was the only one to reject one of those nice high paying salaries that uh, everyone else took. We, at the time, there were two industries that were probably uh, the hottest. One was investment banking and the other was management consulting. I had worked as a, uh, my summer job in between the two years of business school in the strategy department of a large pharmaceutical company. And, um, being a wise and wizened 25-year-old, I just knew that I would die a slow and horrible death trying to claw and scratch my way to the middle. Um, and so come graduation, I rejected all offers. I headed to New York um, with only an a, a inkling of what I wanted to do other than become an actor and everyone Everyone that I knew, my parents, my grandparents, my classmates, uh, recruiters, you name it, told me that I was making the biggest mistake of my career, if not life. Why would you spend all that time and money going through two years? First of all, getting into Wharton was no easy feat. Um, uh, completing the, the program, why in the world? What, What's going through your brain and should we check you in somewhere? So that is my, uh, that, that's my favorite mistake and we can un unwrap that a bit to, uh, that's just the beginning of the story and how I got from there to here if you want or I'm yeah. gonna leave it up to you. Well, I mean, it seems like the first follow-up question is, uh, did you feel like it was a mistake at the moment or at any point, if, if from people's outside judgment, it seemed like a mistake, you were following a path that you were clearly really, uh, really interested in. Yeah, I mean, mistakes, I, I think you can only identify mistakes retrospectively, um, unless I miss my guess. So going into, I mean, we all go into things not thinking that we're making a mistake. I had doubts uh, for sure, because when you've got, smart people and influential people and, and all the world is moving left and you want to go right. Um, you think, well, what, well, maybe they're right. Or maybe I should, maybe it's not too late. Maybe I should pick up the phone and, and you know, hey, I changed my mind. Um, so I don't know that I thought it was a mistake, but I sure did have doubts. And so then um, I don't know if I even, I mean, I think I remember a mention of, of you doing some acting. So how did that, um, that step, I won't even call it a mistake, but that, that unconventional path, at least that first step out of Wharton, how did pursuing acting then lead to advising Toyota? I assume you weren't um, giving acting lessons to Toyota executives, if you know. <laughs> forgive <laughs> no, me joking about that. But. <clears throat> no, um, well, like many of the things in my life, um, it's probably a series of, of happy mistakes if you look backwards on it. Um, I'd love to tell you I've made grand strategies and plans, but almost everything that has happened that's 
of a good thing in retrospect has been a happy accident. So when I moved to New York City, I only had a few dollars in my pocket. I had enough probably for three months of, of, li of living there in the summertime. I thought, well, gosh, if it doesn't work um, for these three months, if I can't get something going, um, I do have an MBA from Wharton and I will fall back on it. At the same time, I recognized a couple of opportunities. One of them was to start my own educational consulting practice as a way to feed my foray into theater. Um, what do I mean by that? In my second year of graduate school, as part of a work study and, and financial assistance program, I worked in the office of admissions. Mm -hmm. and my job was to interview waitlisted candidates. Now, if you don't know anything about getting into business school back then, it's a little different than it is now. But back then, yeah, you had to take, you know, a, you know, a GMAT and, and a score. But really what they wanted was two years of uh, experience beyond college. So you didn't, you didn't leave college and go to a top 10 business school. It just wasn't, just wasn't done. You go straight through, yeah. And there was a fairly you know, healthy waiting list of candidates and understanding um, what then was behind the application process, the admissions process, and what the admissions committee was looking for, you know, it was my job to read a dozen or so essays. Um, uh, I thought that I'm in New York City, there are a host of investment banks that have these two-year analyst programs um, where they send their best and brightest to business school um, to the best business schools, and they come back um, at a higher level, uh, you know, and, and, but, but that's dependent on them getting into one of those great business schools. Right. So having that insight, I approached uh, all of those associate uh, analyst, uh, junior analyst programs, um, basically in that training and education department of uh, Solomon Brothers and Merrill Lynch and Lehman Brothers and all the names that, you know, are kind of merged now um, and said, listen, I will uh, help your uh, your folks that you're sending off to business school complete their um, applications as an advisor. I'm not going to write their essays for you, but I can lend my insight into what makes a good essay uh, like that. And that began my um, that was how I, I made money um, that allowed me to pursue acting on the side. I did spend some time on TV and in commercials and in theater um, until I moved out here to our coast, uh, the West Coast, four years later. It, it actually allowed me to write a book. Um, it's a little known book, um, obviously out of print, but in 1990, a book called The Admissions Guide to Selective Business Schools came out. I had been one of those lucky folks that had gotten into the Harvards and Stanfords and Whartons of the world. And so I had the uh, both sides of, of uh, the writing side and the review side, and that's how things began. I sold that um, to an uh, educational company. Um, I was also teaching um, Stanley Kaplan GMATs uh, in the evening to support, uh, to support myself and moved out here to the coast again with no plan in mind. Um, and we'll, we can pick up on that, but if you had a question on that path, that's how New York City worked out. So you were able to pursue that path and you were you were getting by is that the right phrase to use from from these side gigs um, you were happy with at that point it, it didn't feel like a mistake to you not even no it wasn't waiting tables mistake. wasn't starving yeah it wasn't waiting tables wasn't starving wasn't bartending um i you know i it allowed me to have my own schedule i could go on calls when i needed to um, I met mostly in the evenings uh, with, uh, with these candidates, um, and I made a trip out here to the West Coast, uh, 4th of July in 1989. I decided I better uh, move out here because I had just sold the practice, sold the book. Mm -hmm. um, what better time? It seemed like a turning point. Um, I flew back to New York City, packed out my apartment, drove out here within a week, and started all over. And the first thing I did was connect with my Wharton uh, alumni network, mm -hmm. met up with a company and a gentleman by the name of Dave Power, J.D. Power and Associates, oh. the founder. Mm -hmm. And one, that was my foray into the automotive industry, and I freelanced my MBA here uh, on the West Coast with J.D. Power and Associates, with uh, a number of performance improvement consulting companies, Merits, 
other big, huge uh, companies that served the automotive industry until 1998 when I got a weird phone call from Toyota. That wasn't a mistake on their part. They meant to call you, right? <laughs> how, was, how was that a happy, uh, you know, that it was a different happy mistake? Um, you, you, you take that call when it comes in, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. And I knew the gentleman and, um, you know, I had been working under someone else's banner with Toyota and the University of Toyota, which was a newly formed um, entity, as I was about to find out. But the phone call went something like this. It was just before Christmas. And the phone call went something like this. Um, Mr. May, uh, my name is so-and-so. I am newly appointed Dean of the Associate College of Education, uh, the University of Toyota. It's, I'm one half of the two-part university. We are getting together after the new year in a three-day offsite to figure out what we want to be, but this is a strategic initiative on uh, Toyota Motor Sales part. It's one of a seven-pronged strategy to move into the new era. Uh, we want to figure out what we want to be when we grow up as a university, as a corporate university. We've made rounds and studied the best, Crotonville and, and you know Disney, et cetera, et cetera, but we're not sure what we're all about. We'd, we're looking for the best possible facilitator we can find. Unfortunately, he's not available. Uh, we heard you might be, and that was the, uh, the happy accident that began a long, a long run of, uh, of of over eight years. So, so in your teaching and advising at Toyota, I know you learned a lot from that experience. And you know, Toyota is well known for the Toyota production system and and an approach to management that's often copied. I don't know how well emulated it is, but there are attempts to copy it. I'm wondering, what are your recollections about Toyota's mindset around mistakes as much as you, as you can generalize? Because you know, one of the themes here in the podcast is learning by making mistakes. And when we try to improve um, by running experiments and trying new things, inevitably things don't work out and we could call those mistakes. But I'm, I'm curious how that thought process might have worked at Toyota. Yeah, and you know, um, my experience is outside of, of the production environment, but the challenge was, was kind of a weird challenge for me. And, and the first challenge they gave me went, went something like this. We need to figure out a way to bring the creativity um, that's found on the, the manufacturing side of our business into knowledge work. Because at the time, the end of the 1990s, there were roughly, uh, if you were to count up all the A3s uh, you know, that had been printed and shared, there were probably upwards of, I don't know, 700, 750,000 of those per year being generated. The lion's share of those were in the production environment. And that included not just only factories, but that included um, logistics and warehouses and uh, places like that. And the University you, of Toyota- Sorry to interrupt. Can you do a quick verbal footnote for listeners or viewers who might not be that familiar with Toyota? And A3 is in a nutshell, sorry. Yeah, you know, an A3 refers to a paper size. Um, uh, th back in the day, um, an idea or a piece of communication or a strategy was fit on the biggest size paper that would fit through a fax machine. And back then, um, that biggest size was the international paper size of an A3. Um, it is now, you know, sort of shorthand for, and I always ask people, you know, that, that use A3s in their companies, do you know what an A3 actually refers to? And no one knows. Yeah. Um, but it, it is, um, in the world of Kaizen or continuous improvement, um, one form of an A3 is a story of a team um, they're even called, as you know, they're, you know, they're affectionately referred to some, in pl some places in Japan as Kaizen newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, but it's on one sheet of, of paper. Um, there's an art to folding it. Um, but it tells the story of, of, a, of a theme or a problem, um, what the conditions of that problem are, what the analysis of the causes of that problem might be, what the alternatives in terms of concepts and solutions and ideas might be to counter uh, that problem, and then a plan for uh, experimenting with that solution, which lands us um, on the doorstep of mistakes. 
um, because in the in the in the world of kaizen and continuous improvement, live and well in Toyota and other places following World War II, it was all about small nested experiments, um, done as as close to the front line as you can. Before you went nationwide or company wide or department wide on anything, you would ask the question. Um, uh, you know, what would have to be true for this to be a, a good solution on a broader scale? And you would test out the weak parts of that uh, solution. Mm -hmm. um, um, get proof of concept, um, essentially. And the difference between an experiment and a pilot would be we're trying to make sure this isn't a bad idea rather than, hey, this is a great idea. How will it spread? Um, so the weird project for me was how to get the creativity out of the factory and into the knowledge side in the United States. Toyota Motor Sales is one of a number of distributors, um, if you will, of Toyota products that are made in the United States and everywhere else. But they were basically the marketing arm, sales and marketing arm, uh, the major one in, uh, in the U.S. So when I say knowledge, we're talking about sales, marketing, HR, legal, finance, all of the things that are, that are kind of outside production. Yeah, and it's funny. I mean, you know, I started my career in manufacturing as an engineer, and you'd, you'd think there would be a perception that people in quote unquote knowledge work would be more creative than people in the factory. That would be a stereotype or maybe incorrect perception. But that might have been, that would be a mistake to think that. And that, well, that's why I thought it was weird because I'm like, well, wait a minute. You know, how how the guy's putting on a windshield wiper all day long? How, how creative? is that. And meanwhile, I got these guys doing projects, you know, in sales and marketing, and they're doing these grand, you know, marketing campaigns, and they're one off and nothing's the same thing. And they're project based. And well, lo and behold, there was sort of a fear of failure on the knowledge side of the business where they're at, that what didn't exist on the production side mm -hmm. of the business. So there was a, it was a hearty challenge. And it took several years. And I was, uh, you know, I've told you this story before, but there came a point midway in that eight or nine year run where I was ready to walk out the door because I was ready, you know, I just threw up my hands in the air, I just didn't know what to do. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple epiphanies happened. But um, so back to your question, you know, in the kind of sales and marketing world, there wasn't that embrace of, of failure. Uh, you know, the old fail fast and learn mentality was not there. My client, the dean of the university, saw that as an opportunity to really um, carry out the mission of the University of Toyota, which was to spread and embolden the tenets and philosophies and the uh, methods and practices that had brought Toyota M was bringing them to, and they hadn't been, become the biggest yet, but certainly it was the halo years mm -hmm. of uh, Toyota as an automaker. So it was an interesting, interesting um, project to have. Yeah. And um, you also do a lot of um, strategy work. And I'm, I'm curious, maybe as a, a final topic to dig into here, um, when, when a company invents a new product line or pivots or goes in a new direction, I wonder... Uh, as much as you can generalize or what your perceptions are, how often is that really planned versus it's some sort of mistake? It's a discovery that couldn't really be put into a five-year plan as, as something, well, in year four, we're going to innovate and do this. Yeah, so that's kind of a loaded question um, because I had another happy accident happen to me that concerns strategy, and I'll, and I'll try and short cut the, uh, the story, but I hated strategy in business school the way it was taught. It was very uh, left brain. It was very, let's start with an analysis, um, SWOT, right? Strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. Um, I didn't like that. I didn't like, and strategy was synonymous with a plan or a document that told who was going to do what by when with what resources. That logical, well-reasoned, mathematically determined, market yeah. research driven yeah. plan. Yeah. I hated it. It just wasn't creative to me. It was, I have, I have an underdeveloped left brain. I have an overdeveloped right brain. I didn't like it. I didn't like it until I ran into a gentleman by the name of Roger Martin. And we met each other 11 years ago when we had a book out um, at the same time. His was called The Design of Business. Mine was called, it was my second book. It was called In Pursuit of Elegance. And Business Week, Business Week had recognized those two, those books with a parcel of others as being um, worthy of mention for creativity and innovation and in organizations. And we got to meet each other that way and maintain sort of an arm's length um, appreciation of each other. Obviously, mine 
for him more than the other way. He's, he's a brilliant guy. He, he helped run Monitor Group, uh, was the dean of the Rotman School, uh, uh, University of Toronto. Uh, he's now retired, but he taught me a new way of strategy. It's called playing to win. It's what he used to advise Procter & Gamble. And that simple framework of what's your winning aspiration, where will you play, how will you win, what capabilities do you need, and what management systems are required, and then what would have to be true for those choices to be successful, and how will you test out your assumptions, was an epiphany to me on strategy. So from 2012 to now, I have a completely different view of strategy than a plan. Plans are great. Um, there's a place for them, but when you say strategy to me, it's about the choices that you make, not necessarily not necessarily the plans that you make. Plans may be explicit about those choices, but more often than not, they don't because they don't tell you the important part of, of strategy, which is the things that you choose not to do. They imply them, but they're not explicit about it. So when you ask me, well, how many times is it an accident? I don't know. Um, I have been doing a great deal of work with uh, uh, venture-backed small companies, startups, um, and more often than, than not, you know, the work in the garage is uh, no one has a plan. Um, they're forced to create a plan to get venture backing. They, they, have a, they have identified a problem. They believe they have an elegant solution for it, and they have a passion for bringing that solution to the world. That, more than anything, drives them, and they're in a constant iterative mode until they get to the point where they need that maturity and discipline where someone's going to throw money their way. So I get to see a lot of those companies, and it's super refreshing. Um, do they have a, a, a plan? Yeah. Do they have a strategy? Usually not. Mm. Usually not. Um, not in the way that, that I've come to define strategy. So if people want to learn more, they can Google Roger Martin playing to win. Good, good, yeah. good topic to dig into. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. The book is called playing to win. It's uh, probably eight years old. Um, he, he's always, there's a thing called thinkers 50.com that has the you know, top 50 thinkers. Um, he's always in the top. He's always got a podium position. Yeah. I think he was number one a few years ago, maybe dropped down to number three or something like that, but brilliant guy got a new book coming out, Mark, that you and I should probably talk about because he really takes to task the whole notion of efficiency as the wrong way to go in corporate yeah. America. I, 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 I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't disagree with him. I, would rather use words like effectiveness and uh, other. Yeah. It's an interesting, it's an interesting book. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what to do with it. He's asked me to take a look at it and do something. I'm not sure what, because half of me says, well, gosh, I don't know. That That's uh, maybe my own bias is uh, being revealed. Hmm. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that again at some point when, the, when that book is out, it would be good to, to chat about that. As we wrap up here, I'm going to hit you with, um, I have an oddball question here on, on the question of uh, mistakes. And you mentioned acting. Give me, I'm going to try to hit you, get an honest answer. Any acting gigs that you took that were mistakes because you ended up hating the role or the project? No, but I will tell you that the acting mistake that I did make was leaving New York City for the West Coast. Mm. There's, uh, this is kind of off topic, but since you asked, in New York City, there is more of an artistic uh, intention, um, a purpose about acting. You go to acting classes a lot. You take, you take dance classes, you take improv classes, you try and develop yourself as an artist. When I moved out here, um, and as you know, being a West Coaster, um, we're in the, the shadow of Hollywood and everyone wants to be famous. They don't care about the art of it. Oh. And I realized when I moved out here that I had probably made a mistake leaving New York City. I wasn't ready to do that. Um, I ended up ditching my acting bent and habit um, within three or four months of moving out here and never looked back. Have I used that skill? Absolutely. I, I speak a lot. Mm -hmm. I facilitate a lot. Um, being in front of people, um, uh, being kind of raggedy sometimes in front of people is doesn't daunt me yeah um so that answer i guess that's an okay question no, well, I, mean, hey. I mean a good okay answer to your good question oh no that's right <laughs> uh questions don't always uh lead to uh sometimes the direct answer isn't the best answer so that's interesting but you, you call me a west coaster this is still very new for me 
And what I see driving around um, LA is what, 90% of the billboards at least, or about this new show, this new movie. It's all, it's all yeah. just, hey, watch this. Hey, vote for this in these awards. That's, um, that's my observation yep. for being here. Not a mistake to move out here to LA so far by, by any means. You know, I clearly, Good. I did not come out here to pursue acting or being famous. <laughs> Good. <laughs> there are enough starving actors out here, I think. Oh gosh. So, well, Matt, hey, this has been uh, a lot of fun. Thank you um, for, for, for doing this and let me put you on the spot to talk about mistakes. Our guest again has been Matt May. He's the founder of Stratechia. Matt, what um, can people do if they want to learn more about the firm? Uh, give us the website. Uh, it's Stratechia.com and, and that's spelled, uh, it's kind of a mashup of strategy and technology with an Italian flair. So S-T-R-A-T-E-C-H-I-A.com. And you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Um, I write articles there and on medium.com. So give me a search. Yeah, Stratechia pronounced differently sounds like a delicious flavor of gelato, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or a mispronounced flavor yeah. of gelato. I'll take a scoop of Stratechia. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, Matt, thank you. Thanks again. And, thank you. Uh, you uh, we'll talk to you soon, I hope. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Likewise.